Welcome to Woodland Management. Uh, what is right for you and your woodlands? This is the first in a four-part series of our Woodland Stewards Regional Extension Program for landowners. And I'd like to thank all of you for participating tonight. We appreciate it very much that you have taken the time out of your evening to join us. So for tonight's session, what we got here is three statements that, uh, questions and statements that for you as landowners, we'd like you to look at these statements and uh, discuss them amongst yourself here for a little bit. We're gonna do that this for about 10 minutes. You know, look at the statements. Have you heard these before in the past? What do you think about them? And it's a chance for you to share this back and forth amongst yourself. And we're doing this so that you can start to think about the topic for tonight. We wanna engage you, uh, work with your site host there, and they will provide us kind of a summary statement back uh, here in a few minutes. We're going to do this for about 10 minutes, and then we will move on to the presentation. So at this time, site host, please work with your landowners uh, to discuss these statements. Thank you. So we hope this is going well at this time. We want you to continue to talk amongst yourselves and everything. And site host, as your audience there are uh, discussing it, if there are some points or facts that coming up or statements that uh, maybe they agree with or don't agree with or have questions about, we'd love you to start typing that information into the chat window.
So we see some sites are responding to our statements. Uh, we have folks that are plant, we planting more hardwoods than already are growing on the property. That way, because we know they grow here. They got, we have landowners out there that um, got a mix of hardwoods and pine amongst their property. Uh, question that has come back, why does everyone plant pine instead of managing for hardwoods? Our audience agrees with the first statement, but disagrees with the second statement. For the third question, answers mentioned we're not doing a TSI and trying to do something in marshy areas. So these are what uh, folks we want you to start thinking about. Uh, we're hoping this exercise would be good to set you up for this evening's uh, presentation and everything. We're going to uh, move on now to introduce our speakers. Tonight we have two speakers uh, from the University of Georgia. Our, um, the two speakers are David Dickens. He's a forest productivity professor with the uh, University of Georgia Warnell School of Forestry. He works as a faculty member with UGA since 1999 and was with Clemson University in 1988. He's received a BA in Fer from Furman University, a forestry degree from University of Georgia and a master's and PhD in forestry from Clemson University. His areas of expertise are soil, in sites, uh, pine species selection, and fertilization, herbicides, economics, and water quality. So as you can tell, David is a well-rounded uh, professor, uh, specializing in many different areas of forestry. He has written over 200 forest productivity articles and currently has 35 applied research and demonstration studies uh, ranging from Florida to Georgia to South Carolina. Our other speaker tonight is David Clabo. He's an assistant professor of civil culture. He's originally from Gatlinburg, Tennessee. He studied forestry at the University of Tennessee for his undergraduate and graduate degrees. He's been assistant professor of civil cultural outreach with the Warnell School of Forestry and uh, Natural Resources since December of 2018. Day-to-day -day activities include system county extension agents, private landowners, non-government organizations, and government agencies with forestry-related questions and issues that they have. David's outreach program includes delivery of continuing education programs for professionals and landowners, working with county extension agents to develop programming for forestry meetings, applied field research and demonstration that address the specific needs of clients, as well as publication of extension articles that provide forestry related information for landowners and natural resource professionals. His research interests include forest herbicide evaluations, prescribed fire application, forest regeneration methods, and mixed pine hardwood management. And with that, we're going to uh, turn it over to David to begin uh, this evening's presentation. David? Well, thank you for the introduction, Bob. Uh, good evening, everybody out there. Thank you for tuning in on a, a stormy evening in many places. Let me see if I am, am I sharing okay there? Okay, so tonight you're we're not sharing, David, sorry, oh, not. you're not sharing yet. So go to share screen. Let's see. Screen one, share. Can you see there that? There you go. Yes. All right, everybody. Sorry for the, the technical difficulties there. So tonight we're going to talk about woodland management and what is right for you and your woodlands. So this first presentation is going to cover matching the correct tree species to the correct site. And so first we'll go over why is this important. So site in the context of this presentation is going to discuss environmental factors that directly or indirectly influence tree survival and growth. So correctly matching species to site will result in healthier trees that grow more vigorously over the long run. So environmental conditions for trees are not as easily manipulated as they can be for many row crops, and that's important to remember. Some factors on the site can be manipulated if objectives and economics allow. So examples of that include vegetation, soil fertility to an extent, as well as soil drainage and aeration. 
So a very important thing to remember is trees tend to grow best where they compete most effectively. And so that's gonna be something I'm gonna kind of harp on during this presentation. One main major benefit of matching the correct species to the correct side is you tend to have fewer issues with insects and diseases. Um, and this is mainly because the trees are less stressed. And if you get a, a tree, for example, that's not very drought tolerant, growing on a site that's prone to frequent droughts, it can become stressed and be more prone to these uh, the insect issues. In addition, when you match the correct species to the right site, trees tend to respond better to active management. An example of that might be yellow poplar will respond with better growth after crop tree release on more mesic sites, so wetter sites with deep soils compared to thin droughty sites, which are termed xeric sites. And if you're gonna be dealing with natural or artificial regeneration, matching the correct species to the correct site can result in fewer regeneration failures. So the first consideration was this, is you need to define your objectives. So defining your objectives for your land can help you know what types or species of trees you need. You may have a timber management objective. So this includes biomass, fiber, et cetera. Uh, there's certain trees that may be more suited to that. Another objective might be wildlife habitat or forage opportunities. You might be more interested in mass producing species if that's the case. Um, in some areas, agricultural commodities associated with certain species may be desirable. Uh, aesthetics species may be less important with an objective like that. Um, and then conservation is another one that we commonly hear about. But usually landowners have more than one objective and with multiple objectives, there are some concessions. That is, you cannot necessarily maximize or optimize one objective without influence on other objectives. And in this top left picture, um, I have a decision matrix for picking objectives. So on the rows, we've got resource-based objectives and on the columns are landowner-based objectives. So you can go through and rank these combinations and that's a good way to decide on objectives if you're a little unsure going in. So getting into actual factors that, is, that affect uh, where a tree may be more suited, most suited are uh, climate considerations is the first one we wanna talk about. So solar radiation, precipitation, and landform contribute to climate in a region. And solar radiation is gonna be dependent of course on latitude and then landform with southern and western aspects in the northern hemisphere receiving more sunlight. Temper temperature regimes and extremes are also an important consideration. So these can affect growing season lengths of the, the amount of time between uh, frost during the year. Um, average monthly temperatures limit the northern range of many species. So we tend to see a decrease in diversity as the farther north you go. And then extreme cold or heat in the spring often has a major impact on young trees. So if you're regenerating a stand, that's an important consideration but it's something you usually cannot control. So here I have a USDA plant hardiness zone map and this map is divided into numbered zones that consist of a northerly zone that's labeled A and a southerly zone that's labeled B. And it just gives an indication of the minimum temperature um, over a certain number of years that they've been recording data. And this is, can be useful for matching species to, to site. For example, I'm located in Tifton, Georgia, down in South Georgia, which is considered zone 8B. So trees that occur in this zone, such as slash pine, would not necessarily fail, fare well in zone five, which occurs regularly in the Appalachian Mountains. So likewise, like species like Eastern white pine and birch that grow well in zone five would not perform well down here where I am. So annual mountain distribution of precipitation is something else to consider. So this varies with latitude and altitude and then soil particle characteristics such as soil particle surface area largely influence water available for trees. So water is often gonna be the most limiting requirement for tree growth and species have different requirements, of course. So the amount of water available to a plants at a given location is not always well represented by annual or even seasonal precipitation because evaporation rates change as stands um, grow after establishment and then also evaporation rates tend to increase the farther south you go and temperature and humidity also affects the amount of water available to plants. 
So drought frequency and duration is another important climate consideration. So uh, the biggest concern with that is concerns on new re with new regeneration. So spring and early summer droughts are going to be most detrimental to uh, young trees that you're trying to propagate. And then also in older stands, water stress makes secondary stressors more likely, such as insects and disease that I mentioned earlier. And for instance, here in South Georgia, we had two intense periods of drought during 2019. And in stands that haven't been very well managed, that is, they haven't been thinned and things like that, we're starting to see a lot of bark beetle outbreaks with ips and black turpentine beetles. So that's um, the drought, the intense drought and hot temperatures of the past year uh, stressed those trees and then secondary stressors moved in. Um, the U.S. Drought Monitor, I have a photo of it here, is a good resource to go to for drought information and you can also go back and look at archives as well of past droughts. But precipitation variability has increased in the southeast in recent decades, as ling as, at least as far as as long as data has been taken, and then that's has an increased importance of matching species to site. And climate's going to be most important at a regional scale. So here's some maps that show the drought frequency by season in the southeast from 1895 to 2011. And so drought frequency, which is percent of total years, increases from the, the light yellow color to the darker red. And so map A is the winter season, map B is spring, C is summer, and D is fall. So you can see drought kind of varies by season and by location at different places in the southeast, and that's an important thing to think about especially if you're regenerating a new stand. Next factor I wanted to talk about is site characteristics. So site characteristic similarities can be broken down into broad geographic regions called physiographic provinces or regions. So in these physiographic provinces, parent material, climate, organisms, topography, and geological history are similar to a degree. And these factors all affect soil conditions. So there's 11 physiographic regions in the southeast, and these regions can be broken down into more detailed subregions that are sometimes used to help match forest tree species to site. An example is the interior low plateau in eastern highland. Example is in the interior low plateau, which consists of the eastern highland rim and the penny royal in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Alabama. And then another example is the Middle Coastal Plain, which includes the Tifton Upland, the Doherty Plain, the Southern Pine Hills, and other subregions that occurs throughout Georgia and Alabama and even into Mississippi. So forest classification guides have been produced for some of these regions that can help you match species to site on very specific sites within these regions. Um, here's a map showing the 11 physiographic provinces on the left. And here's a, a more detailed map showing the different subregions, just to note that. And here's examples of two guides that I just mentioned that have been produced by the Forest Service. These are old, but they're very good and they're publicly available. They can help you match species to site on um, different sites, especially in these two regions here, the Eastern Highland Rim and Penny Royal and the Western Highland Rim and Penny Royal. So these aren't going to be available in all areas, but it's worth looking into. So other site characteristics that need to be considered include landform and topography. So slope inclin inclination is important in terms of erosion potential. Usually there's a more open canopy on steeper slopes. In addition, operations are more difficult on steeper slopes as well. Landscape position. So soil productivity tends to to increase from the ridge top down into the valley in different slope positions. Um, aspect, so that's the direction that a landform faces. So east, or excuse me, south and west aspects tend to be drier because they receive more uh, solar radiation than north and east aspects. Mountain ranges have often have different weather and patterns associated with different elevations. So that's another important uh, factor to consider if you're in areas with mountains. And then microtopography can also be important on smaller scales. So examples of that include tree uprooting due to, to wind throw, which includes pit and mound topography. The mounds can sometimes have uh, very good conditions for new tree growth. 
And then bottomland hardwoods are the, the prime example of how changes in microtopography can affect species composition and productivity. So bottomland hardwoods occur along floodplains uh, that are on rivers or along wetlands and an elevation changes as small as three feet have major impacts on tree species composition. And so here's a diagram I've included of a, a bottomland hardwood situation. So this diagram shows the correspondence between alluvial floodplain microtopography and forest cover types. So you can see over here by A, we have black willow and cottonwood growing on uh, the riverbank essentially. And then as you move along this first terrace, say to E, which is called the high first terrace ridge, you move into an upland forest, which includes white oak, black gum, white ash, hickories, etc. So small changes in topography and settings like this can cause major changes in species composition and what species are most suited to the site. Next, we need to talk about soils. So soils supply trees with water and 13 essential nutrients as well as physical anchorage. And there's eight soil orders in the south, which is the, the highest classification. And then all these have shared characteristics that are important for tree growth and health. So one of the, the first things is depth of surface horizons uh, with good rooting conditions. So availability of soil water is affected by depth to a restricting feature, which may be bedrock or certain soil horizons that we call hard pans. Soil texture, which is the proportion of sand, silt, and clay is also a very important consideration for tree growth. So this is the relationship among, so it affects uh, winter water table, rooting depth, and productivity is related to soil water storage and movement. And then soil texture can also affect uh, gas exchange actually with the environment, with the atmosphere. So soil texture is very important. Organic matter contents, another consideration. So this impacts water and nutrient supply. So uh, organic matter is gonna be most important on coarse textured sandy soils that contain mostly sand. Um, organic matter in these soils can help improve water holding capacity because water percolates and infiltrates through these soils very quickly. Soil pH is another important consideration for tree growth. So acidic or basic properties influence available supply of nutrients. Uh, more acidic soils tend to favor or tend to have fewer available nutrients and certain species are adapted to more basic or acidic soil conditions such as pines being more adapted to more acidic soils. And then soil drainage class is also important to look at. So it's important for oxygen transfer to respiring roots and some species are more sensitive than others such as bald cypress, which occurs regularly in inundated areas versus sand pine. So here we've got a soil texture triangle. So that's gonna be determined by sand, silt, and clay percent content. content. And then on this picture on the right, you can see the effect of soil texture on soil water availability. So less available water on the left hand side as you're moving uh, with the sandy textured soils versus clay where you have more available water. And so you can find out soil information from uh, the NRCS web soil survey. It's a great resource for soil resources. Next, I wanna talk about site index briefly. So it's a measure of site productivity based on tree height and age. The assumption is trees growing on a site will follow characteristic height growth curves associated with productive potential of the site. This can be a single or a group of species. Um, here, for example, we've got yellow poplar growing in the Piedmont region. The index age is commonly 50 years for hardwoods or 25 years for pines. And site index can only be measured on trees in upper canopy positions. Um, and it is important to note that site index can be altered through management either for the good or the bad. So, and again, you can find site index and vegetation productivity information on the NRCS web soil survey. Um, just a note here, there are guides that um, help you select species for certain sites based on soil characteristics. Here's an example of one for the coastal plain of Georgia and Florida to help landowners determine if loblolly slash or longleaf pines the best uh, species for a certain soil. And this classification key is just based on uh, the drainage class of the soil as well as the depth to a clay horizon. And so it's a, it's a great tool to use on certain coastal plain sites. 
Next, we need to get into individual species characteristics. So most tree species tend to do well where they are native or naturally found. And some species perform well on a variety of sites through a combination of inherent traits and genetic improvement. And a prime example of that is Loblolly pine. And that's one of the reasons why it's planted so commonly. But the science of silvics deals with the growth and development of characteristics of single trees as well as whole forest ecosystems. And it's important to understand silvics for individual species and how they respond to different sites and management practices. And for an example, uh, physiological adaptations allow some species such as oaks and pine to survive better on drought prone sites. So you can find out more about individual species silvics in uh, another US Forest Service document called Silvics in North America that has two volumes, the first one on conifers and the second one on hardwoods. But the, these volumes are a wealth of knowledge on individual species and they talk about their native range, the climates that they're suited to, the soils and topography they occur on and that they don't occur on, associated forest cover, their life history, so how, how they regenerate, if they're tolerant of shade or not, reaction to competition, damaging agents, and then also management considerations. And I wanted to talk about one example of silvix with a certain species here, so black walnut. So this is, of course, is a highly desirable hardwood species for high-end and specialty wood products. It's a very site-specific species, yet it has a large natural range. Um, Black walnut performs best growing in mountain coves and well-drained bottoms in the Appalachians and Midwest. And soil textures are typically sandy loam, loam or silt loam. And they're also tend to be fairly deep. So if you try to plant walnut on a, a droughty site or a site with thin soils that aren't very fertile, it's, you're probably not setting yourself up for success. So conclusions on matching species to site. So many factors are involved with matching species to site, as you can see, and there's many resources out there, depending on how you wanna look at it, as if it's looking at it from a physiographic province versus species silvics, versus um, several different ways to, to try to um, hone in on what's the best species for a certain site. So climate, landform, soil properties, and individual species characteristics all need to be considered. Uh, manage for species that occur naturally on similar sites in your area to reduce risk of failure. And pines are typically gonna be most productive on more drought prone sites, whereas hardwoods are not planted as much on those sites for this reason. And species grow where they can compete successfully and tolerate local conditions slash environments, not necessarily where they grow the best. And so I'm gonna use another black walnut example along with it growing with yellow poplars. So if it may be a great black walnut site, but if you have yellow poplar that's present in the stand, it will typically always outgrow the walnut. So it's important to think about several things when you're considering species for a site. So here's my literature cited. And I guess I can turn it over to David and Can everyone hear me? I can hear you. All right. Uh, good evening. I'm going to talk uh, tonight about pine wood products and stand management. And David, if you could forward the slide. Yep. All right. First of all, pine wood products. We have uh, poles that are made from our southern pines. Um, basically, the DBHs or that Diameter measurement that's done at four and a half feet above ground line, also called DBH or diameter at breast height. Generally, we're looking at um, tree diameters of at least 11 inches uh, and larger um, with no visible stem defects, no forking, uh, no large uh, branches, um, very straight trees. And typically, we're looking for a minimum of 40 feet of clean wood from ground line uh, up into the base of the crown. And these are high value products and historically they've been the highest value of all our products. Saw timber tends to be the second highest in value. Uh, diameters need to be typically 12 or 13 inches at four and a half feet above ground line. That's the outer part of this particular loblolly pine that's shown to the right in the photo. And um, no, again, just like the poles, no visible stem defects, very straight trees, no forking. Uh, very minimal amount of branching in that first 40 feet or so. 
and these trees will be second highest in value typically. Uh, we get a lot of dimension lumber out of these trees, two by fours, two by sixes, four by fours, four by eights, two by eights, et cetera, of different lengths depending upon the stem length. Okay, next slide. All right, the smaller trees are the chip and saw trees and pulpwood trees. Chip and saw trees are like the poles and the saw timber trees, no visible stem defects for 32 to 40 feet typically. The diameters will range in this class from nine to 12 inches and we get both two by fours and the balance is pulp chips that will go to typically a pulp and paper mill, okay? Pulpwood is gonna be the small diameter trees, usually the 4.6 inch diameter to nine inch diameter trees but they'll also be those trees that are gonna be removed in the first thinning typically that show a stem defect that will also go to the pulp mill, such as a fork below 17 feet or 32 feet and um, uh, other stem defects like excessive sweep. So um, in the coastal plain of Georgia though, our pulpwood prices have been historically at least over the last 10 years or so, very close to our chip and saw prices. So the closer you are to a given mill type, generally the better price you get per ton. So prices in the end, and that will be talked about next week, end up being very local in nature, depending upon where your property is in relation to pulp mills, chip and saw mills, saw timber mills, or pole mills. Next slide. <laughs> Pine stand management now. So we talked about products briefly. Most Southern pines are shade intolerant, meaning that they need a free to grow full sunlight environment. They do not grow well under the overstory of a large canopy stand. So, and think about the big three as well. They need, just like any plant, water, sunlight, and nutrients. So that's what we wanna maximize to them at establishment. There's two main ways to establish a pine stand. One is artificial regeneration on the left with its advantages and disadvantages, and the other on the right-hand side is natural regen. With natural regen, we're gonna use the overstory trees that are there from the current stand of trees, and they will seed in that stand, and at some point, oftentimes in the first thinning of the subsequent stand after need gen, those, um, overstory seed trees will be removed. Very low upfront cost. Again, I'm talking from the right-hand side under natural regen. The difficulty with natural regen though, the stand stocking can be very, very variable from 300 to 3000 plus seedlings per acre. It is harder to manage. It has a, ver a much slower growth rate. It lends itself to a longer rotation, typically in the mid thirties to 50 years or better. Uh, it might be a possible better option though on the poorer sites. Artificial regeneration, now you're bringing in seedlings and therefore new genetics to the site. You're gonna prepare the site prior to planting just like you would if you were trying to grow a garden in the backyard or a crop of corn or soybeans, peanuts or winter grain, et cetera. You're gonna go ahead and prepare the site both chemically and mechanically, maybe just chemically in many places to provide long-term woody vegetation control you bring in some high quality seedlings and you plant those seedlings and that could be around 250 an acre or better uh, based on some recent Georgia prices. The stand is much more uniform in nature. We're typically planting between 500 to 750 trees per acre. Uh, common um, stocking level is 600 for uh, our loblolly slash and longleaf pine in Georgia. So we're gonna have a much more uniform stand, much higher growth rates because we've done a great job pre-plant with site prep to control the woody vegetation and herbaceous weeds to some extent. And it lends itself to a much shorter rotation age. Although you can grow these trees out, uh, especially if you have longleaf pine to a 45 or 50 year rotation if you wish. So it all goes back to the landowner objectives that David talked about uh, earlier. Much easier to manage as well. Okay, so there's the contrast between natural and artificial regeneration for the establishment phase, okay? Next slide. Here's an example of natural pine regeneration. This is after Hurricane Michael in a stand that has enough trees left over to serve as seed trees 
to regenerate the understory in a, and create a new stand from natural regeneration. Loblolly, because it's a prolific cedar, you don't need many trees per acre. <laughs> it is a very prolific cedar, uh, bumper crops probably every two or three years. Um, the seed goes a long way from the tree. It's a light seeded species. Whereas longleaf, you need a lot of trees per acre, typically 30 or more. And these are trees of cone bearing age, typically um, in the 10 to 14 inch diameter class and sometimes even greater. Although they will produce seed and cones much earlier in the life of uh, these stands uh, before they reach these diameter classes. Slash pine is intermediate in their need for trees per acre at about 15 to 25, and then short leaf is about 12 to 20 per acre. And you can burn the understory in September when you see a bumper crop in the overstory trees to prepare the seedbed prior to the bumper crop falling to the ground, which tends to occur in October and November. And the seed likes to have be sitting right on bare mineral soil. So that burn really helps with creating more of an environment for that seed to take. Uh, if it's hitting, if it's on top of mineral soil versus on top of a, a half an inch to a, an inch of organic um, litter layer. All right, next slide. Uh, to the left and to the right, you'll see some examples of natural regen. And again, to the left, uh, the left photo is actually showing the remnants of uh, Hurricane Michael passing through Trutland County, Georgia, uprooting some uh, pine trees. And you'll see small scattered young seedlings coming up in the left photo and in the right photo. But if you notice, look how variable the stocking is from very little in, in one area to many, many in other areas. So it is a harder stand to manage and it lends itself to a much longer rotation with your first thinning typically occurring in the early 20s rather than in the mid-teens. Okay, next slide. All right, this is artificial regeneration example. This is a site that was clear cut and it was airily applied with both imazapir and glyphosate, uh, which imazapir is commonly, uh, common names are um, chopper and arsenal. Also, there's some generics out there as well. It's both soil and foliar active herbicide plus glyphosate, uh, which is a foliar active only herbicide. You wait about two months, you prescribe burn, and this stand was actually V-blade planted. And um, it's now 10 years old and it's doing uh, rather well on some pretty poor soils. And so that's artificial regeneration example where you're bringing in good genetics, you're doing a pre-plant site prep, in this case, chemical, burn, and then V-blade plant, all right? Thinning pine stands. We've gone through the establishment phase now we have trees that have reached merchantable size. Merchantable size means typically a 50 foot tall tree on average, or at least 40 feet to a three inch top outside bark, because they'll cut the top off at about two or three inches. And this first um, thinning will mostly go to the pulp mill. Uh, minimum diameter, I mentioned this early for pulpwood, uh, it's 4.6 inches and better. And it will also remove those defective trees that will always be pulpwood due to not having a clean stem to uh, 40 feet. Okay, that would be the fork of trees, trees that have uh, excessive branching, excessive sweep, excessive sweep being more than three inches of curve in any 16 foot run of the tree. Okay, generally our southern pine stands are thin when the basal area or that cross sectional area. Um, and number of trees total 110 to 120 square feet per acre, okay? Once it gets over that magical number right there of 110 to 120, we have a lot of stress on the individuals, as David mentioned early in his presentation, and uh, they are more susceptible to excessive mortality and, and beetle, uh, beetle kill as well, okay? Live crown ratios, um, pretty easy to figure this one out. Um, if I have a 60 foot tall tree, which is going to be a little bit after the beginning of the thinning age for height, we need at least 20 feet of live crown. That's a real good indicator of when a stand 
is approaching needing thinning. You want to try to have at least 40%, which I believe is 24 feet of live crown in a 60 foot tall tree, but you don't want to let it get less than 33% or the trees won't respond near as well as if you kept that high live crown ratio. And this is especially true for slash pine of all the southern pines. All right, next slide. This is a stand in Bullock County, uh, Georgia, um, about 65 miles inland from Savannah, Georgia, inland from the coast. And it's a very fast growing, it's planted on a former old field site with good fertility, but it's um, really in need of thinning. And the trees have just probably hit that minimum height of, of 50 feet. Okay, so that's the thinning age, what a thinning age pine stand looks like, 15 years old. All right, next slide. All right, that's uh, another look at the same great trees overall, a lot of trees to work with, uh, very little stem defect. All right, next slide. All right, but in the stand, uh, to the left of the, of the photo, the left side, you'll see an open area where the sunlight is getting to the ground. That's a former uh, little Ips beetle spot where the density was just too high, stocking was too high. Just remember an acre of land can only support and grow so many tons of trees, just like it can grow so many bushels of corn, cotton, soybeans, or peanuts. Uh, it, it definitely holds true with trees as well. So this, this stand can't really grow any more tons of wood per acre per year with start having, starting to have some excessive mortality. You'll see the poor trees to the arrows um, that have a fork or what we call a ramicorn branch, a real steep angled branch. Uh, that's gonna make it a pulpwood tree for a long, long time just to the left of that left hand arrow is a forked tree that's also very poor in its um, diameter class so that's going to be removed as well so the thinning comes in and removes the poor trees the defective trees that will always be pulpwood as well as the small diameter trees because they will not respond to the thinning near as well as the larger diameter bigger canopy trees okay all right, this slide shows you the response after a thinning. This is a loblolly pine wood disc, and it has a nice response. If you look at the radial growth pre-thinning versus post-thinning, it lasts about four or five years, and then it does start to uh, narrow down in those uh, annual growth rings. The lighter part of the growth ring is the, what's called the early wood or spring wood, and the darker part of the growth ring is called the summer wood or the late wood. All right, and collectively they are equal to one ring of annual growth, both the early wood and the late wood. Um, you should also note that fertilization really made the trees take off at age 26. So, all right, next slide. This is a stand that's been thin and it's a row thin. Typically these days with logging equipment costs, we see a row plus either logger select or a professionally marked stand and well, you'll see a lot of blue paint on either the take trees or the leave trees. And uh, the row thinnings can be either third, fourth, fifth, or even seventh in some cases, removed in the first pass with a cut down machine. And then the trees with the defects and the small short trees are removed in the second pass with the feller buncher. All right. Uh, just another angle of a row thin with logger select or mark stand. In this case, it looked like it was logger select because I don't see any uh, blue paint, but the blue paint may have actually been on the take trees. Okay, and you're going to thin back to somewhere between 60 to 80 square feet of basal area per acre. As a rule of thumb, we typically see about 40% of the tonnage removed out of a stand in the first thinning. Okay. All right, this is a loading deck example with every pine stem being sorted to its highest value, okay? Um, to the right photo is an arrow pointing to the um, loblolly pine tops, and those pine tops will actually go to the pulp mill, whereas the longer part of, and larger part of the stem is actually gonna go either to a sawmill or to a pole mill. All right, next slide. This is a set of poles, pole trees that are actually going to go to a pole mill. And right now in South Georgia, poles are running about 35 to 40 percent more in value per ton than salt timber. So obviously as a landowner, you want as many of your trees, if they qualify as poles, 
to be counted as poles and go to a pole mill versus a sawmill. Okay. All right. Um, this is uh, the stand that you saw cut just before it was cut with marks on the trees uh, depicting those trees that are poles versus saw timber. And then there's some chip and saw and uh, probably not any pulpwood in there. In your first thin, we're typically going to see 80 to 90 percent of the trees go as pulpwood. And 10 to 20 percent of the trees might make it to chip and saw size and quality stem wise. Um, and those thinning ages are going to be as early as age 12, as late as actually for longleaf pine, as early as 20 or 22, the slow growing trees, slower growing stands. And this is just this example right here for this fast growing loblolly stand. It's probably it was thinned at about 15. Second thin is going to occur about oh, six to eight years later. Uh, and it's going to have a mixed bag of pulpwood and chip and saw. And then the final harvest can be anywhere, and again, this is leaning back towards loblolly pine as early as age 27, maybe as late as 33. And you're going to have chip and saw, saw timber, and poles. And uh, the pole category, if you have a well-managed stand, might range uh, as little as 10% to as much as 30%. There are some cases where you may have less than 10%, um, but uh, so, so that might be mostly a chip and saw and saw timber stand with very little poles. All right. Thinning and final, final harvest timing uh, depends upon natural versus artificial regeneration. Uh, remember, artificial regeneration stocking is going to be very variable. It's going to be slower growing earlier. And so that's going to be a longer rotation. Pine species and genetics, loblolly tends, uh, grows faster than slash by about 20 to 22 percent. And then slash grows probably a 10 to 15 percent faster than longleaf in the first 20 or so years. Site quality is a very big factor. Dave, David did a good job with that. Uh, management intensity is also very important uh, for artificial regen, uh, the, the quality of the site prep job, any herbaceous weed control that's done, post plant, and then fertilization. And initial plant and density and survival are also important. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. You're so welcome. next, yep. Next, we'll move right into hardwood management and, and considerations and products. So what effect or factors affect which species you should manage? So of course, landowner objectives, as we talked about in the first presentation, affect this. Site productivity is a big consideration. So if you, you've got sites on your property that aren't that productive in terms of soil for fertility, then you may be limited on which species you can grow. Current stand conditions is a very important consideration. So what's been the past management history of the stand? Has it been harvested recently? Has it had a partial harvest? Um, what are the age of the trees? How many per acre do you have? The size of the trees? Um, those are, that's an area where a professional forester can really help you. Ownership scale is important cons to consider. So are you, are you working with a smaller ownership where it may be harder to get a logger to um, help you get started with some active management or have you got many acres where that's not going to be an issue. Uh, presence of and proximity to various forest products mills is an important consideration. So the more products mills you have in close proximity, the better off you're going to be. Um, right now the average haul distance in the south is about 52 miles to give you an idea of that. So it's important to consider these things. And then of course market demand at the time when you're doing a harvest for the, the timber products you have on your property. So what factors affect value and product classification? So the type, quantity, and quality of timber products that a tree contains all affect the, the value. So large trees may contain several products while small trees may only contain one product. For instance, small trees may only be classified as pulpwood or biomass whereas large trees may contain saw timber, pulpwood, and or biomass. Uh, the type of tree, or which refers to the species, um, different species have inherently different values with hardwoods. Um, so for example, white oaks, black cherry are gonna be much more valuable than say elms or hackberry. Uh, the quantity of wood in an individual tree, which is termed scale, 
is a measure of the quantity of lumber within a log. So there's Doyle, Scribner, and International one quarter inch rule that are commonly used in different regions and by different industries throughout the Southeast to quantify basically the, the amount of volume in a tree log. And so here I have an example that shows or compares the international one quarter inch rule and the Doyle scale. So you've got the percent difference on the Y axis and the log diameter on the X axis. And the international rule is fairly accurate for all log diameters while the Doyle rule underestimates the true yield of lumber for smaller logs. Um, so, but the actual yield of lumber from a scaled log will vary with mill technology, wood species and other factors. So. These are two of the commonly used ones in the Southeast that I wanted to show the difference in how they compare uh, log scales. So other things to, that affect uh, value and product classification are quality, which refers to grade. So grade is a measure of the quality of a log and the lumber it produces. So grade takes into, into account things like defects. So defects include unsent, unsound end defects, which includes knots, decay, uh, wood shake. There's also scaling defects. So these, these defects include rot or holes that reduce the amount of usable lumber. There's sound end defects, which include stain and doat, which is the start of rot. And then there's also specific end defects, which include bird peck, worm holes, spots, streaks. Um, and then when we're, we're grading uh, hardwoods while they're on the stump, while the tree is still standing, we look at clear cuttings. So typically we divide the tree into four faces and you grade the second worst face. And so that's kind of how you determine your log grade is on that second worst face. And then also another important grade measure is maximum sweep, which results in a percent deduction of usable wood from the tree. So sweep is measured as the maximum deviation of a log from a straight line, and it's measured in number of sweep inches from straight. Um, another thing that affects uh, value and product classification is harvest costs. So this is gonna be affected by woodland terrain or topography and public highway access. So how hard does it get to get the logs out of the woods? Um, transportation costs, which includes distance to a mill. So low value products um, can have to go uh, shorter distances uh, than more value, more valuable products. So it's kind of a supply and demand thing. And then large areas may not have markets for certain products and that's important to consider. And something that can help you with that is the forest products network. So this website gives you a directory of uh, forest product mills that are in close proximity to you. You basically can put in your, your address or location and it can show you what what mills are in close proximity to you. So that's a good website to remember for when you're considering marketing timber from your land. So next I wanted to talk about hardwood wood products. So there's many different hardwood wood products, more probably so than pine that are um, commonly used. So we'll cover these in ascending value. So you've got biomass and pulpwood, pallets and cants, tie logs, which also known as cross ties or switch ties. Of course, there's saw timber, stave logs, and then veneer logs. So first we'll go over hardwood biomass and pulpwood. So biomass is used to generate heat or electricity while pulpwood is used to make paper, absorbent pulp, cardboard, fiberboard, etc. cetera. Uh, pulpwood is usually all hardwood species except the, the darker colored wood of black walnut. Um, the dimensions on pulpwood usually you cut up to about a three to four inch top diameter and the bottom diameter can vary widely. Um, it may reach up to 24 inches and it's for some mills or it may be much smaller than that. Of course, it's all going to be dependent on the mill specifications. Uh, and this would only be for larger trees, trees that don't make saw timber or, or higher value grades. But usually most hardwood pulp is going to be in that five to 10 inch diameter range and you want to have at least an eight to nine foot minimum length at least and then these these trees should have minimum sweep or crook and also should be char freeze because remember if you're selling it for pulpwood especially they don't want to have those char streaks in the wood um, 
hardwood tops as is shown in this top left picture may be used for biomass or pulp wood. So you can see the, the, the butt log or lower logs from that were used for some other products such as saw timber. Um, it is usually recommended that you keep these tops on site as is shown here for ecological reasons. Uh, means that long-term soil productivity and can reduce erosion from the site. Um, hardwood is typically quantified by weight or cords um, when it's sold for biomass or pulpwood. So there's 128 cubic feet of dry wood volume in a cord and one cord equals about 5,800 pounds or so with hardwoods. So moving on to pallets and cans. So cans are used for construction materials and pretty much the definition of a can is a piece of lumber made from a log by removing one or more sides and sawing. And usually you'll have square sides of wood with possible rounded sides on one or more sides. So that's what a cant is. And of course, pallets are, are platforms that are used for shipping goods, but pallets and cants are made from low grade hardwoods. And so these are hardwoods that, that may have some defects, but they're usually a little bit larger diameter. So a 10 inch minimum diameter usually for pallets and cants. Um, knots, stains, and blemishes are allowed, but this can vary by buyer. And the, the most important trait of pallets and cans is that you have sound straight logs that don't have any rot or holes, etc. Next, moving into tie logs. So these are also called cross ties and switch ties. Um, switch ties are going to be the longer versions of cross ties. But cross ties are treated with wood preservative to lengthen their operability and they're often used in railways, bridges, and landscaping. The specifications for them are often buyer dependent, but seven to nine inch diameter cross ties are most common and they're usually about eight to nine feet long. And then switch ties can be from 10 feet long to 16 plus feet long. I've heard about some that are even over 20 feet long. Uh, but switch ties and and cross ties in the railroading world are used on about 90 for 93 percent of railroad cross ties are wood so that's in North America so that's an important market for uh, this type of product. Um, the main thing with tie logs is that they need to be relatively free of defects and decay so structural soundness is important and many species can be suitable for tie logs. Um, Species include most red and white oaks, gums, elms, hickories, hard maple such as sugar maple, and then some species such as hackberry may accept it in some locations but not others. And then of course pines can also be used for tie logs. But all railroad ties are replaced about every 10 to 8 to 10 years so there is a constant demand each year uh, from the railroad industry. So when hardwood lumber markets are poor many sawmills can survive because of the constant demand for railroad ties and the price usually remains fairly steady with them. Moving into saw timber. So this is going to be wood that's used for paneling, flooring, lumber, etc. Um, grading saw timber kind of varies by region. Uh, there's different saw timber grading scales that are used in different places and they can sometimes get fairly complicated. Uh, the value of saw timber is species sensitive. So in the southeast, white and red oaks, particularly Corcus alba or just what we think of as regular white oak and then red oaks such as northern red oak are going to be of higher demand. Uh, walnut, black cherry um, also have, have historically high demand. Some areas yellow poplar, ash, hard maple and hickory have fairly good value. Um, but characteristics of saw timber trees uh, that you want to have sound straight trees with minimal rotten defects because these all affect the grade. Uh, dimensions for these are 10 to 12 inch minimum diameter at the small end um, and then they typically come in 10, 12, 14, and 16 foot lengths. So moving into stave logs and bolts. So these are going to be made from white oak species and stave logs and bolts are used to make whiskey, bourbon, and wine barrels. Um, white oak, Quercus alba is going to be the most commonly used and most sought after species, but uh, chinkapin oak, bur oak, and swamp white oak may have good enough wood properties for stave logs and may be purchased by buyers in some regions. Um, 
I typically do not use species like chestnut oak and post oak, even though they are white oak species. And so wood properties of these certain white oaks, um, it's a structure called tyloses that are in the wood prevent liquids from leaking when they're made into barrels. So there's highest demand for this type of white oak product in the central hardwood region. So we're talking Kentucky, Tennessee, Southern Indiana, Southern Ohio, kind of in, in that general area. Uh, dimensions for stave logs include a 15, 16 inch diameter is pretty much your optimum. You can get a little bit bigger than that. Uh, small end diameter is about 12 inches. As a minimum eight foot length up to 20 feet. And then you wanna have at least two sides that are free of defect. So remember dividing the, the tree into four faces. So two sides free of defect there. And so this, this, these products have a very high demand currently due to the popularity of bourbon and whiskey worldwide. Moving into hardwood veneer, which is gonna be the most valuable hardwood timber product. Um, the dimensions of hardwood veneer will vary greatly by buyer, but it's typically the larger diameter logs. We're talking usually at least 18 to 20 plus inches small in diameter. Uh, the logs are gonna be straight, they're gonna be free of defects and have clear faces on three to four sides. Um, red and white oaks, not all species are gonna be probably the most sought after in the Southeast. So. With red oak species, we're talking about northern red oak where it occurs or cherry bark oak um, and some of the bottom areas throughout the southeast and then black walnut, hard maple such as sugar maple, black cherry and occasionally yellow poplar and hickory can be sold for veneer. And usually your veneer logs are going to be the butt log or that lowest, uh, most uh, lower log on the tree and rarely does veneer make up more than about 10 to 15% of stand volume? And veneer logs are probably one of the most difficult standing timber products to grade. Next, I want to get into specialty products. So these, these products, um, they'll vary widely in value, but I just wanted to make you, make you aware of these. So one example is tool handles, which are gonna often be made of hickory. Uh, baseball bats have historically been made of ash charcoal wood, uh, sugar maple, and drumsticks are often made out of hickory, and of course many different woods used for furniture. Um, other possibilities might include millwork, which is used for window sills, molding, and trim. Um, kitchen cabinets is another one to think about, but it's important to work with a consulting forester to know what markets are available in your area. So management considerations for hardwoods. So a, a variety of timber markets improves management options for hardwoods. And remember that harvesting is a management tool for hardwoods. So having a variety of markets can improve a landowner's ability to perform regeneration harvests and timber stand improvement. So regeneration harvests are where you're trying to promote a, a new cohort of regeneration um, of hardwoods, and this can be done through shelter woods, group selection techniques, clear cuts, and then there's also timber stand improvement, such as uh, crop tree release, uh, thinning, and then you're wanting to create conditions for desirable regeneration with the, the regeneration harvest techniques. So fewer markets can cause unsustainable practices with, with hardwood management. So an example of that is high grading or taking the best trees and leaving the worst trees on site or diameter limit cutting which sets a, th a threshold diameter and all trees below that diameter left on site. So this tends to lead to having fewer quality trees on site and it actually can um, degrade the genetics of the trees you have on site and uh, it's just an, an unsustainable practice that doesn't doesn't lead anywhere in the future. On the opposite end of the spectrum, another example is removal of logging slash for biomass, um, which we talked a little bit about earlier, and this can really lead to soil nutrient issues, especially on low fertility sites. So your species grown should be matched correctly to site, which we talked about earlier. Um, we often rely on hardwood natural regeneration and artificial regeneration 
can be suitable for some species and instances. For example, afforestation of former ag fields and river bottoms, so we're talking fairly productive sites, or hardwoods that like um, hybrid poplar or cottonwood that are planted for biomass on fertile sites. But upland sites can be more problematic for planting hardwoods because drought conditions occur frequently. I also wanted to mention that pines and hardwoods may not always need to be managed exclusively of one another. So pine hardwood mixtures occur on nearly 20 million acres across the 10 southeastern states, and that's according to Forest Service data. But stands like this can diver offer diverse timber product potential because you're growing hardwood and pine products on the same site. Uh, one drawback of this type of management is that management can be more challenging because of the different species, silvics, and traits of all these different species growing in close proximity. But it's a good possible management alternative on moderate productivity sites. So on the most productive sites, it might be best to try to manage for hardwoods, whereas on the, the least productive droughty sites, it may be better to manage for pine that the pine hardwood areas, they're kind of right in the middle. So forest certification is another important thing that, that landowners should consider that manage for hardwoods. So forest certification verifies that sustainable forest practices occur on private forest. And certification can provide market access to area mills that supply certified forest products to manufacturers and retailers. Um, it's usually not difficult to obtain a forest certification credential and several organizations such as the Forest Stewardship Council, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and Tree Farm offer different forms of certification. So work with a state or private professional forester if that's something that you'd like to pursue. So I believe that's all I've got here. Um, me. Let's see. Can you All right, me? folks. So uh, thank you, David, uh, for the presentation and everything. At this time, if you have audience members that have questions, we ask that you begin typing them into the question and answer feature of the webinar. We're going to take a short five-minute break, and then we will go into the question and answer period. Thank you.
All right, folks, so we're going to get ready to start going through question and answers. Uh, remember, if you have questions, please let's enter them into the Q&A uh, feature of Zoom. I see we do have several also in the chat, and we're going to try to get through all these questions and answers here in the next uh, about 15 minutes. And then after that, uh, we've asked site host to, they'll be passing out an evaluation for you to complete. Uh, we appreciate you to take the time uh, to do that. We use that for feedback to build our programs for you uh, for future activities. So with that, I'm going to begin moderating the questions and uh, we are going to start with uh, one from uh, Jonathan uh, in the beginning said after timber harvest should one allow forest to self regenerate or should planting assistance be provided and then he gives an example planting two trees near an old stump and uh, Dave and David I'll let you guys answer those Um, David, just make sure you're unmuted. Thanks, Leslie. Sorry about that. So in that yep. case, it, it kind of depends on what type of trees are most suited to the site and um, the site productivity. So if you're on a low productivity site, some supplemental plantings with pine might be beneficial to improve the overall value of the stand. Um, you may not want to plant hardwoods on a site like that. Um, if the site is on a better productivity site and you can kind of watch over the vegetation that starts to compete with your planted seedlings, um, you could consider planting hardwoods, but again, that's gonna be more effort and work to try to ensure the success of those planted seedlings. So it, it kind of varies by situation, but there are definitely some instances where supplemental plantings can bolster your, the, the value of your natural regeneration, if that if that makes any sense. All right, so in uh, the west, in, in Cherokee County, and I'm assuming this is probably Western North Carolina, uh, since I recognize who it came in from, uh, a lot of discussion about site plans in Cherokee County. What questions should they ask when doing a site plan? So a landowner, I suspect, is uh, maybe uh, working with the professional forester to do a site plan. So what kind of questions might they be uh, asking of that professional forester? And then in relationship to that, they also say, what other hardwood should be planted for a long-term purpose? Well, that's There's a lot in that question. Um... David, you want to help with the management plan? Sure. Um, question. <laughs> as far as uh, I'll let you take care of the hardwood part and I'll do the management yeah. part. Um, for the hardwood, I mean, excuse me, for the management plan, um, it's going to go back to, again, the basics of the site, what it will um, grow best, the landowner near and long term objectives, and, you know, where does timber income uh, come in as far as, is it the number one objective, number two, number three, number four? Um, the size of the acreage can be very important. Um, loggers these days with the amount of money in their invested in their logging equipment they need, unless it's a real high value product like black walnut, uh, which is very site specific, um, you're going to need about 40 acres of um, good timber producing land to have a logger come in again, unless it's a real high value product. So a number of questions need to be addressed with the forester and it comes into play are the site conditions, what will that uh, track of land best support and oftentimes what's already there will be real helpful in answering that question. And uh, your timeline uh, are, are, are very important factors. So uh, David, if you want to take care of the hardwood part, yeah, so so as far as planting hardwoods, I'm guessing Cherokee County is in the mountains. Um, if it's on a slope anywhere, I would be hesitant to plant hardwoods just because they tend to not do very well 
in the, the first growing season or two after planting with drought conditions. Um, and also they're more, they're higher priced than say pine seedlings. So that's another thing to consider. Um, you're, you're paying more to put those out there. So you wanna be sure you can ensure their success. And then there's other things to consider such as herbivory from deer. Um, there's, there's a lot going against hardwood seedlings um, when you plant those, unless you really put in the, the effort to try to propagate those and ensure their success. Um, but if you are set on planting hardwoods, I mean, with the way markets are now, white oak is a great species to choose. Um, Northern red oak's another great one. Um, and, then, and then if you are in the mountains and say like a cove, yellow poplar could also do very well in a situation like that. So those are just a couple of options. So the next question that's come in is uh, from Paul and they're hoping somebody could do uh, explain what is a shelter wood. Okay, so I can cover that. So shelter wood is a, a regeneration harvest technique. So it's a, it's a, it's a multi-step harvest where you're trying to promote species that have a certain shade tolerance. So say in hardwoods, it's often used to promote shade intermediate species such as white oaks because they're, they're, they're valuable for timber and wildlife. So it's one of the species we manage for a lot. And so the shelter wood typically, say if you're in that, the Appalachian Mountains somewhere, you might cut out or remove the mid-story first and that creates filtered light conditions to where species like white oak can regenerate naturally in the understory better. And then a few years after that, you might come through and remove um, a certain percentage of the, the overstory and that creates even better conditions for the, the oaks to take off, but limits uh, the ability of competing species that are more shade intolerant to grow and compete with the oak. So you're basically just manipulating light to get the, the species you want in a stand. And then it can also be done with pine species as well um, for regenerating pines. And there's, there's plenty of examples of that in the literature where it's worked well. So that's kind of the gist of what a shelter wood is. All right, uh, question has come in from Tim Mize who's wondering what is the economic benefit of forest certification? The, the main ep economic benefit is you're gonna have access to more markets. So some timber buyers only will purchase, say SFI, which is Sustainable Forestry Initiative uh, or FSC certified wood. So the, the main economic incentive is that you have more options on uh, timber buyers. Okay, this question's from Jason Fisher, who's wondering, what if you have a low value track with minimal volume, what is the best options or methods to upgrade that stand? And then they also wanna know what is log position and slash was mentioned, but what about stumps? Okay. Um. David, you so want let's to, start yeah, with the, we'll what is a low down. value track with minimal volume? What is the best options or methods to upgrade that stand? Okay, when you say low volume or tonnage, can you be uh, specific on how many tons uh, per acre there are out there on average or uh, the number of merchantable trees uh, with that question? Um, the rule of thumb for pine loggers is at least 25 to 28 tons or one load on the truck per acre to make it economically feasible for them to come to a track. So if you have that, then you would, you would be able to sell that tracks uh, of timber as long as it's, you know, for pines, it would be diameters in the five inch class and better. And you would clear cut it. Uh, if it's of low value and growing slow, I would recommend clear cutting and starting all over with um, uh, much better uh, and current genetics, do good site prep pre-plant, and um, plant the best seedlings you can buy within your price range. Okay, and then the question say, uh, goes on to say, what is log position? 
So that's, that's basically where the log is located in the, the tree while it's standing. So the lowest log on the tree is going to be the butt log and that's your most valuable log. Um, and then you may have a second, third or fourth log above that, depending on how tall the tree is and uh, what your um, diameter cutoff is. And so typically the, the lower logs in the tree are going to be the more valuable um, logs. All right. So, and then the rest of that question goes on to say, slash was mentioned, what about stumps? And I think that's in reference to, are they, do they use the stumps? Do they harvest them? Do they grind them? Stumps are usually left in place unless they're, uh, there's a market for stumps, which would be removal of slash and longleaf stumps. And that would go to a Hercules plant for um, a, a number of different products. But it's, it's rare anymore when we harvest the stumps. They're typically left in place. They're allowed to rot. And um, some professors up at Clemson years ago found that if you plant pine seedlings within two feet of those stumps with the root channels, they actually grow better <laughs> than um, trees planted far away from those stumps and those, those root uh, channels. So it's, it's actually just something that you, you leave for the most part, unless there's a market for your slash and longleaf stumps. A uh, question on what is timber bolts? So the bolts are used to make the, um, used to make the top and bottom of the, the barrel that's used to hold the, the alcohol, alcoholic beverage. So that's, that's what the bolts are. And so they're the pieces of wood they're used to make the top and bottom of a barrel. Uh, next question is, is site prep and clearing between the rows worth the expense? I would say that um, site prep needs to be done over 100% of the property if you're going to be planting pines or hardwoods, um, not just between rows. Because the root zones will be literally everywhere whether it's a pine or hardwood that you're planting by the time they're at a merchantable size. Does that make sense? I hope. Probably does to a forester. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and actually uh, next week we are, um, the presentations will be focused on f uh, looking at the economics of forest practices and I'm sure this will be something that they'll be able to elaborate a bit more on uh, next week also. So where can you sell pine for tie logs? Pine for ply logs? Uh, they have tie logs, but... Um, I wonder if they meant ply logs. Right, or because pines are not used for railroad ties. Um, Typically, yes, that's correct. Right, yes. yeah. so... Yeah. It's I only occasional, it. yeah. It's not very often that they are. If they mean ply logs, that would be a, a ply ply mill. And, you know, again, the radius that uh, David mentioned of somewhere around 50 miles, the higher the value of the product, obviously, the further the haul distance can be justified. Um, you know, you can, you can haul wood up to 100, 110 miles and still get a decent price on the stump. So... Um, Ply logs would be large logs, salt timber sized trees that would actually be peeled into making ply, plywood. Some 30 to 50 plus years ago, one use of the phrase timber bolts was also known as short wood or short five to eight feet in length that were loaded onto an old pulp wood truck. That's yeah, my thanks. response to a question, and I've known it mostly as short wood in a short wood truck. That's back when everything was cut by hand, and uh, they could meander through a woods with no problem, unlike uh, the logging equipment and the, and the log trucks today. Um, but there are other definitions of log bolt, and that might just be one of them. 
Yes, I was referring to the the bolt I mentioned when I was talking about stave logs. There are okay. Def okay. other definitions of it as well. So. Yeah, sorry. Should fallen trees or branches in the natural setting be removed or left for wildlife habitat? I answered that in uh, a text back. And again, with the emphasis in a natural setting, I'm assuming that timber production is a lower priority. So if that is indeed the case and you're trying to keep it aesthetically pleasing, um, I would leave fallen trees and broken branches in place unless it hurts accessibility. I mean, we all want to walk through the woods and if a fallen tree or a bunch of branches um, greatly reduce access, then I would be removing uh, those areas where you want to continue to have that access. Okay, and next question, is there a difference between black walnut grown in the Midwest and that grown in the South the person had heard Southern Planet Black Walnut has much darker wood. I honestly have not heard enough on that to really give a good answer. Um, as far as I know, there's not any major differences, but that might be something we'd have to look more into. Okay. Uh, and question here is related to uh, Pine, somebody wants to know what is the required pH for growing loblolly pine? Okay, loblolly pine and most of our other southern pines can handle pretty acidic conditions. And if you think about the needles that fall every year, um, as they decompose, they make the soil more acidic. And um, loblolly pine uh, can, can be grown in fairly acid spodosols down in the lower coastal plain flatwoods uh, with pHs of as low as four to as high as six and a half. I think an ideal pH for our pines would be in the mid to upper fives, but uh, they can handle uh, from a pH of four to uh, the low to mid sixes. Uh, once you get above six, five, then they, they don't like it. That would be more hardwood loving scenario. All right. Uh, so a person has asked, how important are forests in carbon sequestration? It's, it's, there, it's, it's pretty important. And, it is. Um, <laughs> if you look at the climate data, uh, Georgia, from what our state climatologist told us three years ago, our state average temperature has actually gone down a half a degree <laughs> whereas and you look at Georgia's two-thirds of the states covered in in trees <laughs> so trees are very beneficial in carbon sequestration by they pull in carbon dioxide and they emit oxygen so uh, growing trees is is very very important yeah they're they're an important carbon sink for mm -hmm. for pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and that's I mean that's why we we have all the initiatives to try to save the rainforest and those type, type of things. That's a important part of it. Right. And I, I take an important fact to point out with, with trees is that the wood that we harvest and use to build like our homes and everything ties up that carbon for long periods of time. Right. Yes. So True. I want to take uh, at this time, uh, uh, all we, I see no other questions that have come in. So if anybody, uh, we are at the end of the evening. So I'd like to thank uh, David and Dave for uh, taking the time to give us this wonderful presentation this evening and remind site.